All right, everyone, welcome to State of the Nation. This is episode nine. This is part two. So in part one, we caught you up on what is going on with yams. It's still going on, as a matter <laughs> of fact, as we're recording part two. Um, also, we gave you an update on DEX volume versus centralized exchange volume. In this special part two episode, we've got Vitalik Buterin. We're going to talk about something called ETH Supply Gate. David, what was your take on Vitalik's comment on ETH Supply Gate and everything he said? Yeah, there's just been so much going on in Ethereum in the nation that we had to split this up into two categories. Like Yams deserve their own episode. You honestly, Uniswap exploding deserved its own episode, uh, and also going through the nuances of ETH supply gate deserves its own episode. Uh, Ryan and I, we aren't really coders, and so we wanted to get someone who could speak on a more technical level, uh, and so we just went straight to Vitalik. And Vitalik actually lo loves to talk about this stuff, so we got him on the State of the Nation to help us get through some of the nuances of ETH Supply Gate. For those of you guys that aren't familiar with ETH Supply Gate, uh, I believe it all started with Pierre Richard. Not to name names, but I'm going to do it because it's kind of like a call-out gotcha moment. So Pierre Richard, a famous Bitcoin maximalist, uh, is he's he's also an accountant, so he or a, a an auditor, excuse me. So he's he's very much in this world and loves the fact that you can easily audit the Bitcoin supply, and is a very big proponent of Bitcoiners running their own node. He's he's a Bitcoiner to the fullest degree, uh, and he spearheaded this ETH supply gate effort where he realized that there's no internal function to the Ethereum blockchain that allows you to audit the ETH supply. And so he made this public tweet asking like, okay, what's the, what's the supply of Ether? Do we even know how much Ether there is out there? Which coming from the camp of Bitcoin or sound money is like sacred, right? Like you must know what the supply of Bitcoin is because you check your own node and you check and make sure because you run your own node and you do your own math, right? That's the, that's the Bitcoin or ethos. And, they, and the, the, uh, Pierre and other Bitcoiners, Bitcoin maximalists, I would, I would call them, uh, realize that ETH doesn't really have this built into the clients, right? We don't really have that function. And so we actually didn't really have a quick and easy answer as to how much ETH is out there because it's not built into the system. Now, that doesn't mean that we, that we, the amount of Ether is unknown. It's just, a, a, importantly, just a different way in construction between Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that's about as much as I know. And so I'll, I'll pick it, we'll, we'll pick it up with Vitalik when we turn to Vitalik. There's just one last piece I want, want to bring up before we turn to Vitalik. And it, it, I got into uh, the conversation as to like why Bitcoiners are doing this kind of like gotcha thing. Like it's a very gotcha moment. There's not real much substance uh, behind it. Vitalik will explain more. Uh, and, but I asked Vitalik, like, where is this motivation coming from? Like, why are so many Bitcoin maxis trying to like have this gotcha moment for Ethereum? And his answer while we recorded it might have gotten jumbled by the internet. So I'm just going to reiterate it here. But Vitalik answered that he thinks that there's a lot of people who are really insecure and worried that Ethereum is becoming completely legitimate in everyone's eyes. Uh, and so I'll leave it at that. Ryan, if you want to have any last comments before we hop into the Vitalik interview, uh, let's hear them. Yeah, that's absolutely, you know, just one point of clarification, of course, uh, ETH supply was known. It's just not built into the uh, Geth and Parity clients. So like you can view it on Etherscan, um, you, you can view it in all block explorers, um, it's been charted over time, Coinmetrics, other analytics firms uh, chart it. It's just not a function in the Gether parity node. So that was really the point of contention. And um, you know what? I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll end with this and we'll jump to the interview. This is actually, I ask the question every week, um, you know, what'd you, what's something cool you did in crypto this week, right? Mm -hmm. And um, last Saturday, Pierre, Pierre, <laughs> Pierre answered the question and he said, I helped Ethereum figure out its supply issues, <laughs> something like that. And I was like, you know what? Um, I, I think this is helpful. This is part of going through the gates of what it takes to become a reserve asset and a money. And Ethereum should have a good answer to this question. And I think Vitalik does, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I believe we will see the, the click here for ETH supply button in future Ethereum clients, whether it's ETH 1.0 or ETH 2. So with that, David, let's get to the interview with Vitalik. All right, Vitalik, welcome to the nation. We are doing this very quick episode to kind of just get right to the heart of things. Uh, for context, there has been this uh, pretty pretty avid movement in the Bitcoin maximalist camp. I would I would categorize them not the Bitcoiners, the Bitcoin mm -hmm. the Bitcoin maximalists, 
who uh, are going after the difficulty of auditing the ETH supply. And so there are a lot of different conversations to have that are relevant here, a lot of different nuances to get into. And Ryan and I aren't really all that technical. And so we're just going straight to the source of uh, one of the guys that can speak the best about this subject. So we're bringing on Vitalik to help us kind of dig through these, this, con this actually kind of difficult and nuanced conversation. So Vitalik, thank you for coming on the State of the Nation. Well, hey, thanks. It's uh, good to be back in uh, the nation again. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Vitalik, I'm going to start with maybe a tweet that I saw. And this is not the only tweet, of course. Uh, this is just one of, of, you know, flavor of some of the conversations that have been uh, going on. Um, but I, I just happened to see this, I think, uh, on the 8th. Was that Saturday, Sunday, something? Mm -hmm. And it's basically this sentiment coming from, I think, members of the Bitcoin community, maybe more skewed maximalists. Uh, and it says something like this, the, the Ethereum community can't figure out what the total outstanding supply of ETH is. This is a major problem and showcases why ETH is not good money. So comments like that, I guess maybe like my first question, uh, is that right? Can the ETH community, Ethereum community, not figure out what the total outstanding supply of ETH is? No, and I think the Ethereum community definitely knows what the total outstanding supply of ETH is, and it's like about 112.1 million, right? And you can see that by just um, in, in a whole bunch of ways. Like there's all, all of the different scripts that have been run the past few days. There's, um, I mean, you definitely shouldn't trust them, but you, but like the fact that all of the different ETH supply calculators are kind of on the internet to basically agree to the answer within. Uh, uh, a factor of about 100,000. Um, you can even look at the Ethereum protocol and know what you know about uncle rates, and you can try to estimate the um, Ethereum supply from that, and you can get somewhere very close. Um, so, no, 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 the ETH supply is about 112.1 uh, million right now. Um, I think, like, the, like, people like this, they're definitely uh, kind of engaging in a very serious, uh, I guess, modern Bailey fallacy here. Are you familiar with that term? It's a uh, kind of popular slate star code accessism. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. You, yeah, please. Yeah, so basically the idea is that like, this is a kind of old medieval terminology where kind of in a castle, like I think it's uh, the mod is that it's kind of well-protected castle that, uh, um, you know, you got the wall, you got the tower, you, like it's very hard to invade. And then the Bailey is this uh, kind of farmland below. And the idea is that normally everyone's kind of, you know, happily off uh, farming the Bailey, um, but then whenever someone attacks, everyone uh, kind of retreats back to the mod, right? And so <laughs> the idea is that it's this kind of argumentative dark arts technique where basically you have one position, which is kind of the Bailey, that you uh, kind of state publicly, and it tends to be a much more kind of extreme position. Um, and then if someone actually challenges you in the extreme position, you just kind of say, no, 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 you don't get it. I just meant this a kind of other smaller, totally reasonable thing. Um, and, you know, you can see people in uh, politics saying this sort of, uh, um, or being in this kind of pattern all the time, right? Um, but here, basically, the mod is that, you know, there doesn't exist a uh, kind of, can, uh, convenience function that's very easily accessible from Ethereum clients that lets you kind of go and click and say, you know, the Ethereum supply is like 11202458.9 or whatever it is. And that, but the mod that, or, but the Bailey that they try to uh, uh, kind of implicitly go after, I think, is this idea like, oh my God, no one knows what the Ethereum supply is. Maybe someone snuck in an extra 25 million coins. Right. And like, if someone actually did sneak in an extra 25 million coins, then, um, you know, yes, you probably should uh, be yeah, kind of selling and shorting ETH because uh, they're going to do something uh, terrible with that 25 million and probably dump it as, uh, before everyone uh, realizes uh, what's going on. But, you know, nothing remotely close to that has happened, right? Um, so, like, this is all basically this uh, kind of dispute that has just been blown horribly out of proportion about a difference of, you know, like, really about, like, what was it, 100,000 coins, a few thousand coins, like, pretty much nothing, right? Because, like, 100,000 coins get issued every week. Uh, so, that's, so that's uh, kind of, I guess, the core of, um, uh, of how I see this. Like, 
another analogy I might add is, you know, in neither Ethereum nor Bitcoin nor most cryptocurrencies can you estimate, say, the Gini coefficient, right? Mm -hmm. And the Gini yeah. coefficient is important. You know, the Gini coefficient is really important because you want to, like, if you're going to create a new monetary system, it's important to know, you know, how much inequality the, mon um, the monetary system has. Because if it's introducing a really huge amount, then maybe that's not a monetary system that you want to support. And... Cryptocurrencies are, of course, pseudonymous, and you, know, you can have many people sharing an account. You could have one person having many accounts, and there's just like not a good way of actually estimating this number. Uh, and so, could you just like you know, you could imagine a uh, proponent of fiat currency, a kind of just pressing really hard on this point and you know going around asking what is the gini coefficient of bitcoin what is the gini coefficient of bitcoin you don't know then how do you know that you're not um, th that you're not introducing a um, um a plutocratic dysto um, a dystopia on the order of north korea um, <laughs> and, you know, obviously that argument's crazy and like uh, and we have stat uh, kind of ideas roughly about what kind of uh, of inequality and concentration there is um, in these systems and you know we actually know that for example as far as all the cryptocurrencies go and you know, bitcoin and, and ether are actually both uh, kind of among the more equal ones um you know like a lot of the other big um heavily pre-mined and heavily uh, kind of non-transparently ico'd altcoins they tend to be very very concentrated and you know bgc and ether not um but like that's that's one analogy, right? Uh, so the the mod that they can claim, like the thing that the, the thing that they basically are claiming, is that the total supply of ETH just is this parameter that you know clients just haven't created this convenience function for because they um, haven't like there just hasn't been much demand for it, right? Now, one thing they might you might say is like, well. If we don't have this auditing and we don't have this convenience function, does that mean that there is actually a significant risk that someone will, um, you know, somehow sneak 25 million ETH into the system? Like, okay, maybe right now it's a disparity of 100,000, but if we're not auditing, maybe someone will sneak in 25 million. And I think that uh, kind of completely misunderstands the security model of Ethereum, and I would even argue the security model of uh, kind of cryptocurrency generally. Like. The, basically, I think um, this is a kind of a, a bit of a deeper kind of rabbit hole philosophical point, but I think a lot of people think of verification of uh, cryptocurrency as kind of wrongly being a, a kind of very piecemeal a kind of fact by facts thing, when in reality, verification of a, a, of a blockchain is all or nothing, right? And to give a uh, totally different example of this, like there were some older blockchain scaling protocols that basically said things um, like, you know, we're going to create a scalable blockchain that makes it easy for you to verify the presence of your own coins, right? So basically, you know, imagine like a highly scalable blockchain, you know, even Bitcoin SV size or something like completely insane like that, but where you have a light client protocol that makes it very easy to just, just verify kind of the history and, and the kind of pro uh, provenance of uh, your own coin, right? You know, you have your ETXO, here's the two parents, here's the three grandparents, here's the five great grandparents, um, and, and so on and so forth, right? You know, all the way back to uh, Genesis, and like that's going to be a substantial amount, but maybe a few hundred megabytes, but you can verify it. The reason why that kind of verification is just totally stupid and pointless is because in order to verify that your coin is valid, in order to verify that kind of your coin will be accepted by people, like you don't just have to verify the prominence of your coin. You have to verify that your coin is part of a chain where the entirety of that chain is valid, right? Because even if the prominence of my coin is completely valid, you know, if your coin's in there and your coin got double spent and the double spending got accepted by the network, then that is a chain which is fundamentally kind of invalid and corrupted. And so that is a chain that once people figure that out is just going to get rejected by the ecosystem, right? And so like the fact that I have a coin that's totally valid within the context of a chain that's totally invalid and it's going to be rejected, like that's worth pretty much nothing, right? And so the only verification that matters is verifying that the entire chain and all the rules of consensus have been kind of fully satisfied. And it's the same situation here, right? Like basically there's no value in uh, kind of privileging one specific rule, you know, whether it's the rules about issuance or whether it's the rules about, you know, were the ECSA signatures all correct or whatever, whatever, like 
you have to basically verify all the rules, right? And that's what clients do. You know, they verify all the rules. Um, and so the um, like basically, if um, like the reality is that if he wants to verify that Ethereum is a system that satisfies the goals of being a blockchain, that satisfies the goals of being a a valid uh, kind of substrate for ETH as money and for DAI as money and for whatever other money you like that's um, on Ethereum, then like you have to like there's no value in looking at one single consensus rule in isolation, right? You would also have to verify, you know, verify that um, smart contracts have never been illegally hacked. Um, you might have to verify that um, transactions without valid ECDSA signatures were never included. You have to verify that your coins were never invalidly taken away. You have to verify that everyone else's coins were, not, were never invalidly taken away. Um, so, like, specifically verifying that, um, you know, this one consensus rule has been satisfied as a kind of, you know, it's just, it's focusing on one specific thing when in reality, like you have to focus on kind of everything together and you really have to think about it in kind of two parts, right? The first part is, were the consensus rules that we think the consensus rules are actually followed? And the way that we know that is, well, there's a whole bunch of clients and the whole bunch of clients have processed it. And there's lots of people in the Ethereum ecosystem that have run those clients. Um, so like I talk about the concept of herd immunity here, right? Like, you know, fortunately it's 2020 and herd immunity is an analogy that like pretty much everyone understands. <laughs> but like, you know, the idea is that, um, you know, if you have like a thousand people like in a whole bunch of places in the community that have run a node and have verified each individual piece of the chain, then you know, realistically the chain's valid and like it's incredibly unrealistic that an invalid chain is just gonna sneak through all of them. Right. So I mean like this is the sort of thing that we could kind of rabbit hole deeper if we want to talk about you know the philosophy of sharding, for example, but you no, know, that's a whole other topic. But you know, that's the first thing, right? The verifying that the consensus rules were followed and we have multiple implementations, you know, lots of implementations. So lots of them have, you know, sunk the chain at one point or another. Um, lots of them have um you know, verified any individual block. And then the second piece is, okay, well, given that we know these consensus rules, let's take the consensus rules and let's figure out what the supply is going to be today and what the supply is going to be at kind of different real, uh, realistic points in the future that we care about. Um, so, and if we want to estimate uh, what the supply is today, you know, we can run some of those scripts that determine exactly how many uncles there are. You can do estimates based on uh, kind of, like basically the more exact the number you want, the more kind of work you have to do. And if you're willing to actually process the entire chain, then you can get a number down to the last uh, uh, way. But you know the value down to the last way is not very useful because 14 seconds later, there's going to be another 2.0 something ETH introduced. And, but you know if you want that number, you can get it. But if you're okay with like five or six decimal places, you can do a bit less work. And if you're okay with three decimal places, you can do even less work. And so like, there you go. Okay, so Vitalik, I'm going to try and, and recap all of this in, in as, okay. as short of a bit as, as possible. So uh, Bitcoiners uh, and, and bi the Bitcoin blockchain has this function built into it that just does the audit of Bitcoin, right? And it's built into the protocol, which is really aligned with Bitcoin or values because they really like auditability. That's part of the whole right. value proposition of Bitcoin. It's, it's a function, right? It, it's a function that's built into the Bitcoin client. If Ethereum yes, clients right, wanted yeah. to, they could build in that function too. It wouldn't even take a hard work. Right. Okay. And so B Bitcoiners found out that there isn't a, a this function in Ethereum clients, and so they found this opportunity to nitpick about that. When in in reality, it, the 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 the, re the reason why we know that no one has slipped in any ether in any ways that, that don't fit the rules of consensus is because we haven't hard forked the chain. We haven't had a hard fork. If, there, if somebody wanted to slip in ether in a way that uh, would be invisible to people, it would result in a hard fork and that thing either being invalid or there being a hard fork, which we would have known about. And so, exactly. and so this kind of then goes into the, the second criticism, which after you pressed some, not, not you specifically, but also you specifically, but also people like Chris Berniski and Eric Voorhees and Andreas Antonopoulos, after they brought up the issue that this is mostly a non-issue, it's kind of like this gotcha moment, the, the conversation then kind of turned to, well, Ethereans don't even run their own node because 
it, it because that's just not in their culture, which I agree is actually not really in our culture to run our own node. I don't run my own node. I haven't in a while. I don't think Ryan right. does, runs his own node. But oh, what, do, what you're right. saying, oh, you do, pardon me. Um, <laughs> But what you're saying, Vitalik, is there's this hu herd immunity where not every single individual needs to run their own node. We just need to have enough individuals so to the point where we get sufficient decentralization. Was all of that accurate? Yep, I think so. And I definitely think that it would be nice if we could get more of a node running culture in Ethereum in the future. But I think like we do have to kind of think pragmatically about this, right? Because right now, I think a lot of people don't run Ethereum nodes because Ethereum nodes are expensive. And Ethereum nodes are expensive because we have these big hulking blocks with uh, 12 and a half million gas. And the reason we have big hulking blocks with 12 and a half million gas is because right now the gas price is, well, I think an hour ago when I checked, it was like, what was it, 240 guay or something. And if we had not done those increases, it would probably be like 2,000 guay. Or more realistically, everyone would have um, left Ethereum and uh, everyone would be on, you know, Ethereum Classic or Neo or, you know, one of these other chains. Uh, so, like, in the short term, there's this unfortunate uh, kind of trade-off that we do have to make, and I do think that the Ethereum community, you know, like the Bitcoin community really values the accessibility of uh, reading the chain, but I think the Ethereum community also really values the accessibility of writing to the chain, right? So, accessibility of reading the chain means, you know, like, how much does it cost to run a node, basically, accessibility of writing the chain, how much does it cost to send a transaction, and those two are in conflict because the more space there is, the cheaper the transactions, but the harder it is to run a node, the less space, the, you know, the more expensive the transactions, but the easier it is to run a node. Um, so in the short term, there's not much that we can do, but at the same time, um, you know, like this gets back to one of these other weird uh, talking points that I saw yesterday that, you know, people are kind of gotcha quote tweeting this tweet for myself like four years ago. And I said, the internet of money should not cost five cents, five cents a transaction. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. It shouldn't. I um, mean, you know, the fact that it costs more than five cents a transaction right now is terrible. And that's exactly why we've been working on charting and possibly and roll ups and all this stuff for the past years. Um, you know, if you, uh, send a transaction in like loop ring or zk sync or one of these systems like i think i mean we can calculate the transaction cost on one of those right now like it was what's the eth gas station gas price right now like is it 220 240 one the, of those i checked it was 273 oh wow oh, that's uh zero uh, zero gway celsius i'm excellent um okay <laughs> <laughs> so okay let's like round it up to 300 and be like spartans that are lazy at math and um you know 300 multiplied by about let's say 500 gas per um trans uh, uh, uh per uh, transaction that happens inside of a roll-up and so we get to uh 15,000 guay um and then 50,000 guay multiply by uh was it about a bit uh, about four hundred dollars, um, and we get about uh, six uh, six million, and this is all in units of uh, one over a billion, um, and so it's about zero point zero zero six dollars. So even in the context of today's sky high gas prices, if you personally today are living inside of Loopring or zk sync, then you know in optimal conditions you get transaction fees of zero point six cents. If the batches are a bit smaller, you might get transaction fees of like three or four cents. But like basically, you know, the internet of money is still alive and it's called highly scalable Ethereum layer twos. Um, and so these are things like basically the future that we're working toward, you know, where we have rollups, where we have um, scaling. Uh, another one that hasn't been given enough love is uh, the OMG network. You know, they were kind of very hyped up a couple of years ago. And then I think a lot of people got the impression that they kind of went away and were dead. But, you know, no, they, you know, they have a beta running on mainnet and you can go and use it. And I think Tether is planning on uh, migrating to it soon. Um, so like after we have these scaling solutions, then like we can consider um, or we will be able to have both very high scalability and a low cost of running a node. And like, for example, the cost of running an ETH2 node is definitely already say, like much lower than the cost of uh, running an ETH1 node. Uh, so that's exactly the sort of thing that we'll, I think we're working towards and I think we can have more of in the future. So Vitalik, the, this conversation came out of that, that tweet from a, a big, a, somebody who I would classify in the Bitcoin maxi camp. And it's, it was another one of these gotcha tweets. And this whole ETH supply gate thing has been classified by a number of people. Like, 
uh, Andreas Antonopoulos is, is one of the people that I think I, is the person that coined the, the whole thing, the gotcha, the ETH gate gotcha moment, gotcha question. Uh, and so it seems to be like the, there's the, a certain camp of, of people coming out of the Bitcoin, Bitcoin maximalist cohort that are trying and going for these gotcha things it, it, for whatever reason. And so it, it, it delves back into the, like this whole tribal mentality where there are a couple Bitcoiners who are really loud out there trying to poke holes in the Ethereum value proposition. Like, what's your take on that? Like, why are, why are there so many people that seem to be motivated with like these gotcha things without actually contributing anything of real value either to the ecosystem or to re- or the conversation going on? Like, what's up with this? I think people are scared that Ethereum is gaining legitimacy. So uh, I'm a Bitcoin hat on for and play a little devil's advocate. So um, here's a devil's advocate here. So the fact that Ethereum is five years old and does not have a ETH supply calculation function mm-hmm. in parity or geth, does that mean about the prior i can picture maybe somebody saying that because Uh ether didn't write calculating supply in uh in its clients as a like a an easy button that you press um its priority is not to be a like a fixed supply sort of asset. I mean, the reason you can imagine someone saying that is perhaps because I said that myself on Twitter, I think about two days ago, as an uh, <laughs> attempt to kind of summarize what I thought the best argument of uh, the camp was. Um, oh, so and, you did summarize that. Okay. I didn't read yeah. that. Um, like uh, the, the, my words were something like, um, you know, the facts that Ethereum clients don't, or, or and the community doesn't seem to care about having a convenience function for uh, calculating the Ethereum total supply just shows that Ethereum is uh, kind of much less um, interested in uh, kind of the sound money religion. Um, I use the term religion neutrally, by the way. So like <laughs> Ethereum and Bitcoin are both part of the cypherpunk religion, for example. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, if you are want um, a sound money, then, you know, it's better to have a money whose community is uh, uh, kind of subscribes to the sound money religion, right? Which is, you know, a fair argument. Like, I think uh, that's one way to uh, kind of understand a lot of their positions. Like, you want to have a money whose um, community subscribes to the sound money religion. You want a money whose community s- subscribes to the immutabilism religion and, um, you know, so on and so forth, right? It's uh, kind of that kind of, uh, you know, Richard Dixon uh, kind of rationally crazy sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of line where, uh, you know, being in- incredibly attached to something can be a... a um, um, an advantage um, if it basically uh, kind of makes it more difficult to uh, kind of push a, cer- uh, uh, push a certain thing through someone or, or through a group of people. Um, so I think that's fair. Um, I mean, Ethereans definitely value the sound money religion less than uh, people in uh, the Bitcoin camp do. And I mean, to be fair, like the whole ETH is money meme is like barely a year old for us. The Bitcoin is money meme is uh, kind of many years old. Um, So I think um, like, first of all, if Ethereum people want to, that's uh, that's something can change over over time. Um, But second, I think it's important to note that like there's a limit to the extent to which we can comply with some of these values while the Ethereum 2.0 roadmap is not yet complete, right? And this is another thing that I think is important to kind of understand, right? Because, um, you know, we have this um, looming uh, transition to proof of stake and then sharding and then killing the uh, proof of work chain. And during that whole uh, transition, we're going to see massive changes to the reward formula. We're also going to see fee market reform, uh, um, aka EAP 1559 implemented at some point. Um, we're going to see, um, actually uh, see for the first time, like how many people are willing to stake and kind of what exa- uh, exactly the actual issuance rates and what exactly the actual burning rates are. And out of this, we know it could end up being that the ETH supply growth rate is negative, right? I mean, if fees continue the way they are today, the ETH supply growth rate is definitely going to be negative. Um, in which case, um, you know, the analogy I made is like, if a zero growth rate is sound money, then, you know, this, what does the negative growth rate mean? Does it mean even supersonic money? Um, so that's, 
Like, but like, this is all future stuff, and this is all a kind of unknown. And there's definitely aspects um, to the if, um, Ethereum culture that are kind of explicitly understand, right? That, like, as I think I summarized a couple of years ago, like, Bitcoin people think Bitcoin is 80% complete. Ethereum people think Ethereum is 40% complete. And I think now, maybe instead of 40%, it's more somewhere between uh, kind of 50 and 60%. But, you know, it's, it's that kind of mentality, right? And so people understand that there is this technological roadmap ahead. There are these uh, kind of economic unknowns ahead. And it definitely is something that uh, kind of aspires to have certain economic protocols. But like, what's the point of verifying that the current rules are being uh, 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 kind of, uh, you know, uh, satisfied to this extreme extent of having uh, kind of all of these different functions for verifying it if we know that these are things that are going to change in one or two years anyway. And after the one or two years, uh, I think uh, people... And after the economics get nailed down, that's something that people can and will take very seriously. And people are taking very seriously, right? So, like, for example, people, you know, we see these ETH2 staking reward calculators and we see these ETH2 issuance calculators. And there is this growing community of people that do take ETH2 economics uh, kind of extremely seriously because they see that, you know, the ETH2 economic model is something that's been made with uh, kind of a lot of care and love. And it's um, this thing that's... Uh, theoretically meant to uh, kind of stick with us for the long haul. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we do, have, basically, we, we need to take this uh, kind of more long-termist perspective and, you know, look, look at, well, it, it's funny to say, yeah, caring about what will happen three years from now as a long-termist, but, you know, that's, like, basically, if you will change things. Yeah, and, you know, all, also, the, another narrative that pops up, um, David David mentioned one, which is, you know, Bitcoiners or maximalists will say, hey, Ethereans don't run their own nodes, and that's a big problem, um, uh, which many do, by the way. But, but uh, another, I guess, narrative that gets put out there is that um, Vitalik and, insert, you know, dev overlords here, act as a you know, federal open market committee, basically, the FOMC of the U.S., and they set um, issuance, they set supply. Can, can mm. you talk about that? I mean, what's to prevent the FOMC of Ethereum, um, you know, as, as, they would, as they would phrase it, uh, from, you know, increasing issuance to something and maybe like funding, uh, funding a yacht or funding your favorite charity or funding... Um, I don't know, ETH2 development even. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So I think people uh, kind of further away from the Ethereum community definitely, I and mean, they definitely overestimate um, the uh, Lord Dictator Vitalik, but they also um, overestimate even the Ethereum line of FOMC. Uh, so first of all, I mean, you probably remember this yourself, right? When the issuance reduction from three ETH per block to two ETH per block was happening, that was not core dev driven. That was not Vitalik driven. I think that was even driven by like Ethereum community members that were in what was uh, maybe not yet called, but starting to become the ETH's money camp, right? Does that sound accurate to you? Yeah, I, you know, from my recollection, I think people who are holding ETH and who are believers more in the the idea that ETH is a you know, sound collateral sort of drive those sorts of changes, and they'd have a lot to say. I know I would. <laughs> I could speak for David too. If um, yeah. issuance were to increase for something mm -hmm. that was outside of the social contract, for instance. Right, exactly. Um, now let's look at another dimension, uh, gas limit increases. So mm -hmm. gas limit increases, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, like, so if you go right now to etherscan.io slash chart slash gas limit, right, open up that page, um, you see like the graph, right? And it looks like a, a bit like a kind of city skyline. You know, it's got bop, 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 down, 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 down. Uh, I guess I'll wait for you to open that up. Sorry, what was that URL one more time? etherscan.io slash chart slash gas limit. Chart. There we go. Yep. See, okay, you see the city skyline. Um, so let's look at that chart uh, kind of very closely, right? Um, so one... One of the things that you might notice is if you look at kind of the beginning stages of that chart, like um, open up and um, search on Google Images um, U.S. Um, historical income tax rate. Um, like images. Um, 
Yeah, yeah images. Let's see if we can uh, find a, a good one. Just the second one. Um, no, the second, marginal tax rates, right? Um, so see how, like, the chart, like, kind of jump back and forth between the two, right? Okay. Just, like, look at the ether scan, look at the, yeah, um, look okay, back to the taxes, ether scan, taxes. Um, so I, I actually made this point in a, a blog post, uh, kind of. Actually, this is another one of my points when I was like being kind of self-critical of Ethereum governance um, a few years ago, where basically these charts both look kind of similar, right? They have this pattern of like staying very, very cleanly at one one exact position for a long time and then jumping, and then staying very horizontal and then jumping. And this is a property of basically a magic number that gets constantly renegotiated by a committee of technocrats, right? Like mm -hmm. if you have a number that's constantly renegotiated by a committee of technocrats, then, you know, this is what it looks like. Uh, so the, um, um, now let's look at the chart more recently. Um, if you look at specifically what happens after January, 2019, right? Like look at the, um, the last uh, kind of bar like there and then uh, kind of after. So notice, um, zoom out again. Um, I just refresh maybe. Um, notice how that last 20% of the chart looks much less clean than the first 80%. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first 80% looks, right looks here. yeah. The first 80% looks incredibly clean, and then after that, it gets very choppy. Um, so here's what's happening, right? Basically, what's happening is that the first uh, the gas limits at the beginning they actually were essentially set by a committee that sets magic numbers, right? Basically. The Ethereum Foundation, maybe well, we, maybe one time Lord Dictator, the Vitalik, um, said, hey guys, maybe we should increase the gas limit. And all the miners were like, yes, my lord, we should raise the gas limit. And they changed their settings with the clients and they raised the gas limit. And, you know, this was how, th this was admittedly how governance worked in the earlier days of Ethereum and we were, when we were able to kind of pull off the Dow fork and these other things, right? So that, um, but more recently, what's been happening was the um, latest two gas limit increases were minor driven, right? Basically, there was very little input from the from uh, Lord Vitalik. There was very little input from the Federal Open Markets Committee. Um, it was basically miners initiating, and in some cases, miners disagreeing. Like there are a couple of mining pools, some um, just. Um, switched from 8 million to 10 million, a couple of other mining pools stayed at 8 million. And so you saw the gas limit kind of going, bouncing up and down. And even when it got to 10 million, the, if you look at kind of the daily average, it wouldn't be 10 million, it would be maybe 9.9 .9 or 9.8 million because there was this kind of ongoing disagreement and the gas limit would still be kind of bobbing up and down a lot, right? And the most recent one, um, the rise from 10 to 12.5, like you can, can see even more clearly how bungled that was, right? Basically what happened was that, I remember back in May, um, a, I think it was a spark pool, I think, I remember it was Shin uh, reached out to me um, and he basically said, you know, hey Vitalik, um, we're considering maybe we should increase the gas limit because uh, transaction fees are getting a bit higher. And this was back when it was uh, about 20 to 30 guay, right? And I replied at the time, you know, maybe no, we shouldn't because um, that'll get um, Lord Peter Salagi and uh, or Salage, and I'm sure I'm bungling the, the, the name, um, angry. And, you know, uh, Lord Peter Salage is doing a lot of, uh, kind of great work. And, uh, you know, we should not be making his life harder because, um, you know, they, he's been doing a lot of, um, I mean, uh, he and his team have been doing a lot of great work on uh, kind of making uh, GAF. Uh, work more efficiently and um if we're just gonna go and uh, kind of undo those efficiency gains with the stroke of a pen that's you know not a very good thing and that could cause uh, kind of dos issues and all of this stuff now six weeks later the transaction fee situation got way more serious and i guess the mining pools by themselves you know they talked among each other they um talked to each other you know like in their wechat groups and the tele in the, the telegram and um you know discussed had some discussions and they started uh, kind of bumping it up from 10 to like maybe it was like 12 or 12 and a half and the this happened without permission from myself without permission from the federal open markets committee without permission from any of these people and i learned about it when i saw some a message on twitter and i checked on etherscan like oh my god there's a block with a, ga a gas limit of like 10.4 million and it's rising now um, and in, so, in, indeed, Peter was not happy. <laughs> and, and indeed, yes. Um, 
Pete, uh, Peter was not happy. Um, and the interesting thing about the rise was that apparently they did not even agree on whether it was uh, they were would rise to twelve or twelve point five, right? Like I remember. The, when the gas limit went up, it rose, and then it actually, I, I think it might have even like briefly gone above 12 million and then below 12 million, and it kind of bounced between, uh, around. And it seemed clear that there were some people voting 10, some people voting 12, some people voting 12.5. And then, like, if you go back to Etherscan, like, you could see the kind of like the Etherscan chart gas limit, like, you could see the vol the day by day volatility in the, in the gas limit because there was this kind of gas limit voting war going on. And after another couple of weeks, I guess. Uh, one of the mine aprils that was voting 12 relented and went up to 12.5 and now we have 12.5 right so this whole thing was um initiated driven carried through by miners without core def permission without lord vitalik permission without uh, any of this stuff and so like in light of this like how can you call ethereum governance centralized right like it's clearly this kind of complicated multipolar t uh, um, kind of tug of usually cooperation, occasionally a bit of war between these multiple like, kind of highly indep um, independent and uh, kind of diverse people from diverse backgrounds. Um, and like realistically, I think like issuance is um, uh, similar, right? Like issuance is uh, not going to go up just because like one group of people wills it. And I think there's definitely a, a strong enough constituency that will just fight to the death against issuance increases that like people can feel like kind of safe and sound that issuance increases are not going to happen. I think the answer to the question, Vitalik, as to, to how you can call Ethereum governed and centralized is by just totally foregoing your, your anyone's one person's responsibility to understand nuance and kind of just cater to their audience and tell people what they want to hear. So in light of all that, Vitalik, I, I commend you for, for keeping your head above all the mess that you can, you can easily find in the depths of Twitter. And I thank you for being a, a, a sober voice in a very loud, messy conversation. That's uh... I mean, I'm always glad to say stuff. <laughs> All right, uh, Ryan, do you have any last questions before we uh, wrap this up? No, Vitalik, that was uh, that was super helpful. Thank you. I think um, I think folks uh, will be interested to hear all this. I guess maybe one last question, just because it's uh, super topical, and we will be releasing this sometime today. Today is back to those gas prices. They are going vertical right now. There's uh, mm -hmm. craziness, something called a YAM token, which is going crazy. There's, there's always something happening in DeFi. It, it appears like Ethereum block space is becoming more and more valuable. Some of that value is, is driven from speculative value at this mm -hmm. point. Um, like, is that going to continue to, to be the case? Are you seeing any, any hope uh, you know, around the corner with some of this layer two scalability before ETH2 ships? Ooh, a very good question. I mean, I think I have a bit of an answer, which is the um, which has to do with rollups and specifically optimistic rollups. Um, so we know, right, that there is the two families of rollups. There's the zk, there's the optimistic. The zks are live already, um, but the optimistics are still a few months away. And the reason why the optimistics are a few months away is because they're trying to do something much more complicated than the zks, right? The zks are just trying to support payments and like uh, maybe a dex. The optimistic ones are trying to support full EVM execution inside of a rollup, and there's a lot of a kind of devilishly hard challenges involved in that. Um, so, what basically the one of the silver linings of this, though, is um, that I think optimistic rollups are going to be ready for a kind of non-financial applications and for you know like natively issued assets and some of these other things before they're ready for DeFi. And the reason for this is that for a roll for a rollup to be useful for DeFi, it has to be like really security wise nailed down, right? And if the security breaks, then you know all hell breaks loose and people uh, kind of lose a whole bunch of money. But if you just want to use a rollup, say for like Reddit community points or you know like some other kind of lower value thing, then the nice thing is that the security requirements on the rollup are much lower, right? And the reason is that if it turns out that the rollup smart contract is broken, then as long as your rollup scheme is only using a, a kind of assets that are native to that protocol, so it's not using external assets, 
all you need to do is just deploy a new smart contract and that new smart contract can have the fixes and everyone can just be told to kind of pay attention to the new smart contract and accept the new smart contract as being a kind of the canonical definition of those assets instead, right? And so basically kind of when you're using an application that only has native assets, so like an example of this would be like if you imagine a version of Augur that only uses Rev for everything, right? Because Rev is kind of defined by the Ethereum protocol. And if Augur breaks, then, and if Augur works that way, then if Augur were to break, then they can just hard fork Rev. Then, so for those kinds of applications, like the security requirements are lower. And so I expect those things to be among the first use cases of uh, some of the optimistic rollups that are uh, uh, coming out. And I'm looking forward to those optimistic rollups. And I, I think they are going to come out quite soon. So we've got ZK right now with Loopring and others that's happening right now, optimistic of the type that you were talking about. Uh, are we weeks, months away, do you think? Um, I think uh, the optimistic roll-up teams that I know are definitely saying like a couple, um, a couple of months, um, but I do think we'll have a kind of test versions uh, kind of um, even before that. Very good. Well, it, it does seem like the high gas fees are um, pushing <laughs> and accelerating hopefully some of these efforts because it is becoming uh, very uh, urgent and, and um, kind of center point for the Ethereum community right now. Uh, Vitalik, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for joining the Bankless Nation in this special session. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's been good to be here. Take care. Take care.